At the crossroads of the modern and the ancient stands a city called Delhi. The mythical Indraprasth of the Pandavas. The Rai Pithora of the Hindu kings. The colourful history of the Sultanate. Siri. Tughlaqabad. Jahapana, and then Shah Jahanabad. Every new dynasty believed it was resurrecting Delhi and that the history of the city would be tales of their glories. As great emperors and their noblemen lay in their darkened tombs Unsung and forgotten, the heirs of a Sufi Kawali wafted in from another mausoleum. That of a fakir called Nizamuddin Olia, who preached the sublimal essence of impermanence and the futility of powerful men's quest for omnipotence. The tombs themselves a reminder that no victory could vanquish that ultimate barrier, time. This blood-stained gate in Delhi, called the Khuni Darwaza, symbolizes the bloody rites of passage. The year was 1857. An 82-year-old Mughal, Bahadur Shah Zafar, had become the rallying point for the rebellious soldiers who had launched the first war of Indian independence. Seismic convulsions which followed marked the end of centuries of rule by the Mughal dynasty. Yet. The cruelty of the reprisals that ensued, what the British termed as mutiny, rocked Delhi. The progenies of the great Mughals were summarily executed at this gate. Their severed heads presented to the deposed monarch. Bahadur Shah was himself exiled to Rangoon, where he died, incarcerated, lonely, a broken man. Delhi lamented its lost glory, and the British relocated the capital of their Raj to Calcutta. However, a strain of the Mughal lineage survived. While the successor to the throne, Mirza Fakru, was among the dead, one of his sons, Mirza Farkunda Jamal, was hidden away by a maidservant. Pakiza Begum's grandfather, then just five years old, lived to tell the tales of his lineage to his daughter and granddaughter. Pakiza Begum, separated by five generations from the last Mughal monarch, bears the weight of her lineage with a dignified grace. This is our city. Our ancestors, they were the founder of the city. Daily Raj, we are proud of it that this is our city. Today, this retired government servant lives in an upper middle class locality of New Delhi. A few pieces of jewellery and some secret Mughal recipes passed down by her mother are probably her most cherished inheritances. I have some jewellery pieces, my grandmother's jewellery, which was given to my mother, and I got it from my mother. There were secret recipes that I cook myself. Although we should teach these recipes to others also, but you know, uh, uh, this is a traditional style to keep, you know, certain secrets of the family. Pakiza Begum may not have illusions of permanence or grandeur, but her ancestors, the great Mughals, certainly did. While Akbar was to establish his capital in Agra, his grandson Shah Jahan chose Delhi and commissioned a new city. Shah Jahanabad, the
that would rival the heavens in beauty and comfort. A mosque bigger than any the world had yet seen was also built alongside. The Jama Masjid. To this day, the religious epicenter of Muslims in India. While Jama Masjid symbolizes a cultural continuity, the ramparts of the Red Fort stand testimony to a grandeur that was of the Mughals, narrating a tale of contradictions. On the one hand, the stunning ostentation of the peacock throne and the dazzle of a Kohinoor. On the other, the austerity of an Aurangzeb. Then, the desecration and plunder of Delhi by Nadir Shah and the inevitable decline and fall of the Mughal Empire. Unlike the Hindu rulers who were cremated upon death, numerous Muslim rulers and their courtiers are buried in the city. Their mausoleums proclaiming their grandeur. These eloquent monuments, their interiors throbbing with silence, often unmarked and unkempt, lend Delhi a mystery, born of a history several centuries old. In the process, Delhi earned several epithets. The city of tombs, the city of jinns. The monuments were the life of Delhi. They were mainly mausoleums of dead kings or commanders. They were palaces. And they were forts. They were the three monuments in which the, particularly the Muslims, went in for. Traces of a lifestyle that was spawned by the Mughals of the Red Fort add to the romantic overhang of Delhi. Muhammad Ilyas belongs to a lineage of pigeon trainers, a lineage which goes back to the days of the Mughals. It was their patronage which gave his ancestors a special status. Today, his modest aviary showcases all breeds of pigeons, and Ilias still retains a special pride in his profession. इनके रंग तो बेगिनती हैं और बेशुमार हैं अगर इस तरह रंग गिने जाएं तो सुबह से शाम हो जाए रंग नहीं गिन सकता इसकी कोई कीमत नहीं है इसकी कोई कीमत का अंदाजा हम नहीं लगा सकते ये जानवर कितने का कैसे कब बिक जाएगा ये तो घाक के ऊपर डिफाइड किया जाता है कि सौदा कितने का घाक मांग रही है जिस हिसाब से उसको फरोख कर दिया जाता है दीस पिजंस आर नो ऑर्डिनरी बर्ड्स they have been trained in the sport of kabutarbazi. Ye kabutarbazi ka shahi zamane se hi chok chala rahi hai. Jab jama sit ki siuniyon pe chok laga karta tha, baasha ke zamane mein, to us zamane mein bhi kabutarbazi hi hua karti thi. Kabutarbazi was once the indulgence of the rich and the famous. Today, this sport is seldom celebrated, and only symbolizes Delhi's tryst with its medieval past. Walking into the dingy walled city of Old Delhi is akin to opening a chapter of this history. The links with the Shah Jahanabad of the Mughals survive in many nooks and corners. Gali Parantewali, where the inviting aromas of frying parantas is a quaint reminder of another lifestyle, a lifestyle that was. Yet other landmarks have fallen prey to the onslaught of time. In what is today a busy bazaar lived Mirza Ghalib, arguably the greatest of all Urdu poets. This decrepit structure once resounded with Ghalib's poetry.
Halib's poetry was adopted by the courtesan before the court finally came to acknowledge his greatness. Sensuous voices popularized his poetry in the mansions of the rich before they woke up to the great poet. Even in the throes of extinction, the romantic splendor of the Mughals was manifest in music and poetry. The rich nobility patronized the arts and crafts, built magnificent havelis and clung on to a lifestyle that celebrated decadence. A decadence that preoccupied them even as the vestiges of their empire slipped away. Nineteen eleven, George V, King Emperor, arrived at the Royal Delhi Darbar. Hundreds of local princes who owed allegiance to the Emperor congregated with their own displays of ostentation and power to submit before the British monarch. And it was at the Delhi Darbar that King George V decreed that a new city was to be built around the old Delhi, which would become the capital of the Raj. Edwin Lutyens, a brilliant architect, was entrusted with the job of building a capital city that befitted the might and the glory of the British Raj. It was an enormous task and Lutyens enlisted the help of another architect, Herbert Baker. A site south of the old city of Shah Jahanabad in the wilderness of Raisina was chosen as the center of this new capital. While Lutyens and Baker was to conceptualize the grandiose designs of the British imperialists, a young Sikh contractor gave it a physical shape. Knighted for his part in the effort, his name was Sir Sobha Singh. The British architects and the Indian contractors envisaged buildings that would rival the spectacular palaces of Europe. A 340-room viceregal lodge was conceived on top of the Raisina Hill. The 200,000 square feet structure was accentuated by a dramatic axis and symmetry. From its vantage could be seen the Rajpath and India Gate, a World War I memorial. A stunning Mughal garden terraced at three levels was landscaped around it. While the Viceregal Lodge was designed by Lutyens, Baker designed the secretariats, north and south blocks, which flanked the palace, and the circular legislative assembly. In his famous travelogue, called the City of Jinns, William Dalrymple writes, Authoritarian regimes tend to leave the most solid souvenirs. Art has a strange way of surviving under autocracy. Only the vanity of an empire an empire emancipated from democratic constraints, totally self-confident in its own judgment, and still, despite everything, assured of its own superiority, could have produced Luchun's Delhi. New Delhi took 20 years to build and cost 15 million pounds. New Delhi indeed was a capital that could showcase the regal paraphernalia of the British imperial dominance. Yet fashionably elegant and fit to accommodate the refined tastes of Europeans who considered themselves the master race. A spectacular shopping mall was also envisaged, Connaught Place, which became the commercial center of this new Delhi.
Over the years, tree-lined colonnades, sprawling bungalows, typical of that period, surrounded with greenery, came about. The grand structures of governance were surrounded by a meticulously planned city. Early memories of Delhi is it was a very quiet, dignified, clean place. Um, there was no hoochooch element. Very, very reserved and quiet and decent people. In her 80s today, Mrs. Jaspal provides a link between the Delhi of today and the romanticized Delhi of the Raj. The entree to this city that drew its snobbery from its proximity to the white rulers had been ensured for Mrs. Jaspal by her father, Sir Soba Singh, the Sikh building contractor. The social activity was so restricted with the foreigners only. We mixed up with very few Indians then. Only all the foreigners, foreigners one after the other. Every second day there was a party in the house, an elaborate party. The arrangements from Bengals, all catering and everything was done from them. And uh, it was very, on a very posh and high standard. Ironically, the imperial structures which were designed to inspire awe and servility were later to be co-opted as the temples of independent India. The home and half of the world's largest democracy. As independent India grappled for its foothold, Delhi once again in her long history assumed the role of the political capital, the seat of governance and the hub of democracy. However, on the stroke of that midnight hour, when India attained independence from 200 years of British rule, millions of refugees were pouring into the capital from the state of Punjab, which was perhaps the most affected by communal carnage. Their psyches scarred by the Holocaust of partition, destitute and penniless. This immigration was inevitably to leave a deep imprint and change the fundamental character of the city for all times. You had Mushairas and there were Mujras. They were the sort of things that the rich of the city indulged in. Then suddenly came this uh, enormous flood of Punjabis from all over Western Punjab, which became Pakistan. And suddenly there was a change in the language, change in the way of living. Among the refugees who found shelter in New Delhi was Dayal Kalra. He had emigrated here with nothing in his favor other than grit and the fabled Punjabi spirit of enterprise. Punjabi ko lijiye aur usne sardaron ko lijiye. Wo zyada matlab hard work karein. Wo nahi dekhte ki koi kya kam koi kaun sa hai, chota hai, bada hai. They made well, they did well for themselves. It was amazing that you didn't see any Punjabi beggars. And they were all started prospering after a while. They had to work very hard. Today, New Delhi of the imperial town planners has extended way beyond what was originally conceived. In the last four decades, Lajpatnagar, a refugee colony of the 50s, has transformed into one of Delhi's most prosperous business districts. And Dayal Kalra's little optical shop has grown in size and business turnover. The struggle for existence of men like Dayal may have faded the traces of a gracious lifestyle that once was. But the ceremonious change of guard at the Rashtrapati Bhavan is perhaps a conscious effort to preserve a few elements that lend a sense of romance to this city.
The national capital area of Delhi today is one of the largest metropolises in the world, certainly the largest in India. 1,485 square kilometres with a population of over 10 million that inhabit its ever-expanding boundaries. For as a poet wrote, Delhi is the heart of India. The city has exerted a gravitational pull over people from all over this vast country. Unless we do something drastic, it is heading for disaster. Uh, life has ceased to be gracious. We, it was very gracious living in large gardens and around your little bungalows. And now there's hardly any space. There's a uh, endemic constant traffic jam on the streets. The river Yamuna, lifeline of Delhi and its 10 million denizens. Today, one more silent witness to the city and its ever-evolving history. What was once a natural boundary to the east of the city has been bridged several times over to help the metropolis cross over to the other side. A booming real estate market has ensured that a substantial population of the Delhi middle class and its intellectual elite seek refuge in these relatively affordable areas. The clutter of high-rise buildings that signify no historical genre of architecture are the direct result of an amorphous industrial society whose aesthetics and values are defined by pragmatism rather than romance. Over a thousand years and more, Delhi has learned to celebrate change. Today this city is more a celebration of a society in transition than a lament to its colourful past. For the Green Revolution of the late 60s and the economic liberalisation of the 90s has also meant a new breed of youngsters asserting a pan-national and indeed a global identity. The refugee from Punjab, the descendant of Mughals, an old woman lamenting a gracious past, indeed personify the watersheds of the city's legacy. But the essence of Delhi lies in its doctrine of transience, that the old must give way to the new. The progenies of our protagonists are increasingly shedding the baggage of the past to forge a new identity, an identity that asserted itself as India celebrated 50 years of her independence in a new idiom, in the heart of Lachun's Delhi. Edwin Lutyens, like many before him, desired to erect grand monuments to perpetuity. But that divine architect had other designs. His majestic tributes to the Raj are today awash in the light of freedom. They celebrate the world's largest democracy, peopled with the elected representatives of this huge country. No longer do these structures emphasize imperial magnificence, but assert the collective will of a billion people. Mortal men could only mold brick and mortar, not time.